welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. And I'm so pleased to have Louise Perry on this week. She's a writer and campaigner based in the UK. Um, she's a columnist at the New Statesman and the Daily Mail. Um, but what we're really going to talk about uh, this hour is her new book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century. Um, so I, I think this book is just awesome. Um, I'm really happy to have you on, uh, especially because even just in the title, you actually take aim at the sexual revolution. And so much of the conversation around this seems to have been, uh, seems to have, have kind of avoided really taking aim at where I think a lot of the root of things that people are complaining about, especially women are complaining about, um, it's just a lot of folks who are, especially are coming over from the left, from the left are not willing to talk about the relationship between some of the freedoms that they champion and perhaps the consequences that they don't enjoy. And you definitely do that in that book. So I'm so pleased to, to welcome you to High Noon, Louise. Oh, what a pleasure. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's, let's start kind of with that, which is um, you really make an argument against this book, um, in, in this book, against centering freedom, particularly sexual freedom. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think it could be broadened out from there. Um, you're, you're, you're making an argument that freedom, while it may be a good in a limited circumstances, um, it, it may bring pleasure to a certain number of people, but in the sexual realm, it's actually had a lot of negative consequences. Can you maybe like elaborate on your argument? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a slightly uh, disorientating one, I think, for some readers and reviewers, because obviously freedom is a good thing. It's what we talk about all the time on the left and the right. Um, will um, elevate freedom to the very top of all of the, all of the virtues that we're seeking. Um, the argument I make in the book is that the, the, the common narrative around the sexual revolution from feminists and other progressives is that the, the, the reason that we still have so much unhappiness and so much dysfunction in our sexual culture is because we haven't fully implemented the freedom project that was begun with the sexual revolution that we're not free enough that we have to keep um you know traveling down that road towards greater and greater freedom and, and and we will eventually end up with no sexual harassment with no um uh sexual violence all of the thing you know all of the things bemoaned by me too which is still um very much at the fore of all kind of all, all feminist thinking of from all quarters um the thing that I argue in the book, which is runs very much counter to that view, is that actually sexual freedom is a cause of much of the unhappiness that we're seeing and that more and more freedom will not cure what ails us. Um, the reason for that is to do with the fact of sexual asymmetry, the fact that women and men are fundamentally different in a very important physical and psychological ways. And what used to exist before the sexual revolution was a um, flawed and often unfair, but also very um, complex and finely tuned system of laws and norms and institutions, which sought to regulate that sexual asymmetry and protect men and women and children from the worst um, possible consequences of, of sexual misjudgment, misbehavior. Um, and that was torn down pretty much entirely. I mean, we do still have some of these kind of the relics of these institutions. Marriage does still exist, for instance, even if it's no longer um, the norm, particularly for anyone outside of the, um, the upper classes. And, uh, and there are still kind of vestiges of some of the old ways of thinking, particularly among older people. But in general, what we've seen happen has been a, um, a wholesale rejection of the old sexual culture. And in its place, what we have is the consent model, which is that it, basically anything goes as long as everyone is, is willing and able to consent. And I don't think that that model is nearly, nearly up to the task of replacing what came before. And I think that the hurling more and more freedom at a culture that is already I think in denial about the existence of sexual asymmetry more and more so is only gonna result in further pain mm 
So why is it that consent is is not enough, right, um, to distinguish, uh, you know, not only rape from not rape, but good sex from bad sex? Why is it that you think that consent is just not able as a concept to guide us in that way? Because it seems to be what what is being proposed as the alternative, right? Um, mm -hmm. The only limits on sexuality and sexual freedom should come from consent. I think that consent is important, but I think it's a very, very low bar, which ought to be trivial easy, trivially easy <laughs> to jump. And indeed, there are all sorts of um, acts and phenomena that the vast majority, vast majority of us instinctively feel to be awful, which do jump that bar. Even if we have um, some remaining taboos and restrictions on something like child pornography, for instance, widely available, but also criminalized and condemned. There are all sorts of things adjacent to child pornography and adjacent to child abuse, which do jump the consent threshold and which it's impossible to argue against if all you've, the only tool you've got available in your rhetorical arsenal is the consent tool. Um, uh, drawings designed to look like child pornography, for instance, or adults dressing up and pretending to be children, or all manner of things which are not technically illegal, but which are also um, intuitively hor horrifying. And, you know, further to that, I think that the consent framework, if taken to its logical conclusions, and the, and the sexual freedom as a principle taken to its logical conclusions, inevitably leads us to a, to a road further and further any of the apparently irrational restrictions still placed on human sexuality you know there have been all sorts of efforts post-sexual revolution to destigmatize paedophilia in various ways with you know more or less success there were periods in the 70s and 80s where um paedophile advocacy groups were surprisingly successful and able to get a hearing in all sorts of corridors of power in, in the UK and America and, and and places like Scandinavia often fated as being the sort of um, most advanced progressive nations where child pornography was, was legalized along with other pornography in the 60s and it was only several decades later that those laws were, were reassessed. Um, some of the most influential thinkers of the sexual revolution, um, people like Foucault, were really quite open in advocating for the destigmatization of paedophilia. And their argument was never that it was okay to violently coerce children into sex. Their argument was that children could, in fact, sometimes consent to sex in some circumstances. So their argument was entirely within the consent model. It was just a tinkering at the edges, as they would see it, and a... And a um, a debate over exactly where the boundaries sh should fall. Because of course, you know, the, the, the age of consent varies between countries. There clearly is a degree of arbitrariness in where you set these limits. And if you've done away with any of the um, deeply felt moral objections to the sexualization of children, then really what you're left with is just a kind of um, a debate over terms and over, and over exactly where legal thresholds should be set um, with with no kind of um, moral weight left in your argument. And I would say that that is happening again. I think that there was a reaction against, in the 90s and so on, there was a reaction against that, that loosening. And I think that we're swinging back again. And the problem for um, many liberals who feel instinctively appalled by say something like cuties during the netflix show which received huge condemnation from um conservatives because it featured 11 year old girls being very um sexualized in excruciating detail both in posters and also in the film itself even though the film itself was was the, you know the, the moral of the film supposedly was um anti the sexualization of children. The film also featured an awful lot of sexualization of actual children who, who genuinely looked like they were 11 years old. And conservatives who are still um, invested in some of the old sexual norms are quite comfortable in condemn with condemning cuties. 
liberals were really dumbfounded because what do you say you know if 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 you've signed up to the project of um radically transforming a sexual culture and and rejecting anything deemed to be remotely kind of traditionalist then you've all, the, all you've got to talk about is consent you're going to really struggle to um to deal with people who are determined to push their radical agenda still further. I mean, it seems like there are two problems with putting consent in the center. The first is what you just pointed to, the arbitrary line. Um, and and I, I've always kind of been skeptical. I think on the right, we use these kinds of arguments as well, um, especially in the transgender context, where we imagine that there's a firewall between children and adults. Um, and that we can kind of endlessly promote something as positive for adults and then have this arbitrary firing, you know, sort of firewall mm -hmm. where, you know, <laughs> when you're 17 and 364 days, it's a moral evil um, to, to chop off your breasts, for example, and, and go through irreversible hormone surgery or hormone um, taking, taking hormones and then irreversible surgery. And then on, at 18, it's fine. It's just like, on the on the menu, right of of mm -hmm. the the freedoms that are um, cherished, right, or are, are key to um, to having a free society. I think that's kind of inherently untenable for the reasons that you just stated, and the arbitrary nature of it makes it very very difficult to defend. And of course, I think in some ways, um, Americans Americans puritanical culture is. <laughs> um, America's puritanical culture is really an aid in this uh, in this endeavor because they have no mm. problem with the arbitrariness and arbitrary nature of it. And sometimes I think too much, right, where they imagine that, you know, men looking at 16 or 17 year old girls is akin to pedophilia, right? Um, when obviously biologically those are very different, um, very different impulses. Sorry, there's a, it's New York. Yeah, right. I've got a lot of traffic <laughs> noise in the background as well. We'll just have to. <laughs> um, but the other problem with consent is that, and, and, and this is this is a quite controversial and feel free to push back on me, but it sort of assumes that women know their own minds in advance sexually. And it yeah. seems to me that so much of what makes the, the polarity between men and women um, interesting and fun and like sexually arousing is not laying out in advance of actually you know being seduced being wooed and it seems like the consent model it's obvious that in its extremes it leaves no room for that that's why you know in, in the u.s feminists are up in arms against a song like baby it's cold outside right um but but on the flip side like it puts a lot of pressure on women to sort of have this very almost masculine way of thinking about their own sexuality like I like these acts and I don't like these acts and I have a list in advance. And and mm -hmm. the reality I think is, is much more complex than that and, and much more specific to the person, to the man in, in the heterosexual context. Right. So I, it almost seems like a, a very artificial construct, particularly for women beyond the obvious baseline that you started off with. Right. Almost all societies condemn rape, mm -hmm. uh, like violent, forcible rape, but like off of that baseline, it seems like a very um, kind of cold and un unfemale way of thinking about sex. Yeah, the, the, the sexual bureaucracy project, <laughs> um, which is so interesting, they often ends up kind of attempting to recreate marriage in one way or another. I have some examples in the book of people um, coming up with all these kind of elaborate schemes where you'll sign a contract together, for instance, and then you'll take a selfie of, yourselves holding the contract before you have your your hookup you know this was the that we used to have a thing we used to have a whole thing for this <laughs> and there were photos and, and documents and everything associated with nicer it. nicer photos even than mm. selfies you know you, you hired a professional yeah. photographer <laughs> yeah why not invite your friends and your family <laughs> um so it is kind of funny how you end up circling back towards towards some of the old solutions to this problem um yes I mean I would say that no one knows their own minds especially well I think that's just the nature of being human. Um, that is clearly on a spectrum, but um, our ability, I'd say particularly when young, but by no means just when we're young, to have perfect insight into our desires and what's good for us is um, 
I don't think anyone really is possessed with that <laughs> that kind of superpower. Uh, we're all sort of um, muddling along, and um, this is the. It's so that's my son in the background. This is the reasoning behind having social guardrails in place, and institutions and systems of education that say that um, there are certain things that normally are good for people, that normally result in good outcomes, that are that are good heuristics to follow when you are young and inexperienced and shall I, shall I repeat this in a second you're yeah go go for it you can take yeah. a take a moment it's not live I think he's up is, is our nanny just got home it sounds like a, a, a nappy change that is not welcome <laughs> <laughs> poor baby he's how, how old is your son he's 16 months and uh he's been a little bit poorly sorry okay should we go <laughs> i think he's all right now um uh where was i going for this yeah so i would say that that men and women alike are both um struggle to know our own minds perfectly and have perfect insight into what's good for us and what we really want um i don't think that it's associated with youth and we clearly recognize in in law that the ch children are particularly unlikely to be able to guide their own decision making well which is why we we don't permit them to um but it's also something that we shade into we know that these lines are arbitrary the line of 18 16 whatever it might be um they have to be arbitrary and they have to be in place but there's also clearly a lot of gray around around those thresholds and um that's what social guardrails are for, that you have systems of education and um, incentives that encourage behaviour, which for most people will result in good outcomes, um, that will, for most people will lead to, to better decision making than otherwise. And the risk with just throwing those social guardrails out the window and there are some people for whom they probably aren't the right aren't the right thing to follow the conventional track but equally there is there is generally a reason that these things have become conventional and I think that we are putting far too much pressure on say 18 year olds technically adults who are presented with apparently all of the options in the world available to them including a whole bunch of crazy new options like reconfiguring their genitals surgically let's say which weren't previously available to them and we say your only guiding star in deciding whether or not to, to, to take these decisions is what you feel in this moment is your current desire and I think that that is it should be no surprise that 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 kind of heuristic is is doomed to failure. Well, you started off um, right in what it what was then called women's studies um, is now almost universally called gender studies, and maybe you have something mm. to say about that. Um, I do. But, how do you guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, but what do you think is the relationship between where we are now? Uh, and, and by that, I mean the denial even of the biological, very obvious biological differences, I should say, between men and women, i.e. our genitalia, you know, secondary sex characteristics. Um, what do you think the relationship between, say, second wave feminism is and that? Because once you get kind of in, into the 70s and 80s and 90s, it seems much tighter and you do start to get arguments for that. Um, but I, I've experienced a lot of pushback in sort of saying that Actually, it seems like this idea that social construction is the dominant driver of differences between men and women, it does go back further. And, and I would really be curious uh, to your, as your opinion on it, because you have studied these things extensively um, as, a, as a women's studies major. So, um, Yeah, it is a source of controversy, <laughs> including among uh, some of my radical feminist friends. And I... I I started out in the radical feminist camp. You know, I used to I used to subscribe much more to socialization theory. I don't think socialization is completely irrelevant. We clearly do see cultural variation 
um, which suggests a degree of you know flexibility um, on the biological template, but also the biological template is also rock solid. And it, you do reach a point where you, you cannot um, socialise away sex differences, which are very profound. Um, and yes, so what most radical feminists would say is that the trans movement is um, radically at odds with their view of gender, in that what the trans movement says essentially is that it is not your body, your material reality, which determines your your se your sex identity. It's your personality. I mean, they would say gender identity, but what they really seem to be talking about is personality, um, to the extent to which you conform to masculine or feminine stereotypes. Um, and whereas radical feminists would say masculine and feminine stereotypes are are false and oppressive and in an ideal world we would just have sexed bodies and we would not have any of these kind of elaborate accoutrement that come that comes from gender right so in that sense they are completely opposed as as ideologies but i do think that the second wave um undermining of gender roles deliberate undermining of gender roles that the, in the introduction of the idea of masculinity and femininity being bunk and actually being oppressive constructs that all should be resisted i think that did pave the way for the trans movement which is the which is the much more radical iteration of that view which is not just that you can be whatever you want to be you know biology is not destiny you can um you can you can be as masculine and feminine as you want has developed to the point of saying that actually you can completely reinscribe on your body depending on your own desire that, that you shouldn't be not only should you not be constrained by um society's expectations of you you can't you shouldn't even be constrained by the body you know it's all and in fact that your access to new forms of medical tech which have only just emerged within recent sometimes very recent, very recently, um, and none of which are more than half a century old, that your access to that medical tech in order to properly realise your, your identity um, is a human right to be funded ideally by the taxpayer. I think that that, I don't think that second wave feminists set out to do that. And I think also that the, the trans activists many of them are determined to um, erase their, their feminist form others, you know, um, and direct a huge amount of anger and sometimes violent aggression at these, at these feminists. I also think that they did inadvertently pave the way for exactly what we're seeing now. Um, so I guess there's, there's two, two points or questions I want to go to ask in response. So, One's really a statement, the other one's a question. But the, the first part is, um, I, I love the phrase you've used elsewhere, which is, but I think it encapsulates the second wave feminist view, which is essentially that sex differences stop at the neck, mm -hmm. right? Um, when the reality is that we do have, to the extent that, you know, we need scientific evidence for the fact that men and women on average have different personalities, different psychological traits, right? There is plenty of social science to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me, again, speaking of arbitrary, arbitrary to say that the body below the neck is, um, you know, not is, is determined by sex, biological sex, but the brain is not right. Mm -hmm. um, that contains your true self or whatever. Um, so that that's one point. But, but the other point is you brought up technology and, and you focus a lot on that um, in your arguments. You say essentially a couple things. One, that the pill had an enormous influence and, and you actually kind of point away from activism. I mean, we've been talking about different waves of feminism, but you almost seem to have a more um, sort of historical view of why the relationships and roles of the sexes have gotten where they are today. Um, that is much less dependent on say suffragettes, right. Um, and much more dependent on developments in technology and in economics, right? The economics of the family. So maybe could you lay that out, um, those arguments out for us? 
Um, before I do, I, I would just say as an interesting point that the, um, a comparison that is sometimes made by some um, uh, some scientists who specialise in these psychological sex differences is, 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 is to compare facial features between men and women. Like there are ways in which um, men and women's faces differ often, right? With things like men have bigger noses and stronger jaws and, and so forth. But the differences between individual features are often two overlapping bell curves. You know, some women have big noses, some women have small noses. But in concert, with all of these features arranged on a single face, you can 99 times out of 100 plus immediately identify whether someone is male or female. And personality sort of has the same effect. You do sometimes have people who, who have unusually feminine or masculine personalities slash faces. And you will sometimes have, um, you know, one element of your personality, which is not in keeping with what's typical of your sex. But normally in concert, these things hold true. And actually the 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 um the entire personality of a, of a man or a woman is normally much more typical of their sex than not with although obviously there are exceptions um and at the pers at the at the population level they're very obvious um depending on the trait you're talking about but anyway yes i i, I mean in conclusion i can i completely agree that the, the the idea that that any of this would have stopped above the neck is absurd um your question about technology yeah, I, I think in general that the, um, I think of it as the great woman theory of feminist history, the idea that the key thing that's driven all of this has been particularly um, charismatic, influential writers and campaigners. Clearly such women have existed and have sometimes had an enormous impact, but they normally have, have achieved things only when the material groundwork has been laid um i don't think it's a coincidence that the suffragettes succeeded only at the end of the first world war um which had demanded you know female participation in the labor market and um was also hot on the heels of industrial development including the um invention of the internal combustion engine which just completely transformed the role of male physical strength in the economy. So, I, I think I think in general, as a rule, we we have we should we should look less at feminist campaigners and more at things like the washing machine and the pill and um, the disposable nappy and all of the other things which have really radically transformed women's lives and allowed us in general to spend less time keeping our household warm and fed and more time in public life um, with various kind of legal barriers removed at the same time. And I think that in terms of the sexual revolution, um, as it relates to sexual culture rather than the workforce, um, the pill is the technology shock. It's the, it's the thing. It's such a big thing that we call it the pill with a capital P um, because it is for the first time in the history of the world a piece of technology that allows women to suspend their fertility um, in a way that women can control and can do so invisibly. Um, and I think it is not a surprise that that would have had a transformative impact, although some of, the, some of its effects are surprising. Who would have thought, for instance, that the invention of the pill would lead to a huge spike in the number of single mothers? It seems completely counterintuitive. But I, but I think it's because what the pill did effectively is it undermined social structures that had been in place to stop young horny men and women being unattended <laughs> essentially right all these things that existed to try and prevent um prevent um illegitimacy because illegitimacy is a problem for community not just for couples and their families um and so you have all of these um, all of these things in place, which, yes, do oppress female sexuality, as has been pointed out by many feminists, but also oppress men. You know, if you are chaperones and sex segregation and marriage and all of the all of the various, you know, trad things um, which were designed for exactly this purpose to try and um, control 
young people's fertility essentially suddenly if you have a te piece of technology that does that for you why do you need the shotgun marriage and so all of those things fall away very very rapidly um after the pill is made available to unmarried women um and that's why for instance you end up with this the, the reason i think that you end up with this huge rise in single mothers which you wouldn't have expected is because the pill undermines all those social systems but isn't actually effective enough to prevent unwanted pregnancies all the time because the pill is only about 91 percent effective in typical use and so you end up with an absolute rise in the amount of sex outside of marriage that's happening and in say nine percent of those cases per year you're going to expect um an, an unwanted pregnancy and there will always be some women who don't want to have an abortion and would rather and would rather be single mothers so it's a perverse it's a perverse outcome but it but it does make sense when thinking about the um the complexities of societies and how they actually work at scale yeah i mean it, it also has an effect on women's choice as a partner, right? Um, one of the things that uh, I always have had kind of argued back to me by the left was, well, you, this is actually not new. Um, you know, a large percentage of women had sex outside of marriage in 1945, according to surveys. Um, but that sex was genuinely premarital. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 engaged, like it's engaged people, it's completely different. But but I think in that context, right, mm -hmm. um, if pre-pill, to the extent that illegitimacy or um, out of wedlock, I don't even want to say out of wedlock births, but sex before marriage happened, it was really before marriage in a context where at minimum these people are seeing each other, they're, you know, you want to use the 50s thing, going steady, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty rare for women without the pill to have sex with someone that they weren't at least interested in marrying. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me like that, for example, with the pill, even having something like the shotgun marriage norm would work out very badly um, because you're not talking about, I mean, it really wasn't that, uh, the shotgun was only speeding up what would have happened anyway, right? The pregnancy was speeding up and maybe not in every case, right? Um, but these two people were at least compatible enough to to want to see each other on a regular basis. They know more about each other. They're interested in more about each other. The the standard, if if you can at least mentally take pregnancy off the table, you know, um, it seems to me that there are many, many more incompatible couples having sex than before the pill, right? Because it just takes that burden away from the woman of considering whether the person that she's having sex with actually would be at least a decent husband and father. Mm. Yeah, I always find it, I've always also find it kind of annoying when people say, oh, but look at these, look at this historical example of all that. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I mean, there have been billion, the billions of humans who've existed. Clearly, there have been all sorts of unusual exceptions to, to historical rules. Um, I do not think, though, that there has ever been a period in human history before now where female virginity is considered to be a burden, right? It, I mean, it's been very common for um, young men to be anxious about sexual inexperience um, before marriage. But the, now when you have teenage girls who are 14, 15, 16 and, and, are, and are anxious about being virgins and this being embarrassing low status they're frigid they're prudish you know they should be they should be uh, more sexual experience than they are I really don't think anyone anyone would have would have felt that way in the period before contraception because it is so clearly in a young woman's interest and in her family's interest for her to have sex in prudent circumstances which yes does mean often um having sex during a period of engagement um, the, you know, the baby arriving five months after the wedding day is, is, is something that you will see in a lot of census records. So it was not as though people always exactly stuck to the no premarital sex convention. Um, but it was a, but it, but the convention nudged people in that direction. And there were exceptions and there were, um, institutions designed for those exceptions which were often 
horribly cruel mother and baby homes for instance um where mothers and children were abused i don't i i don't want to be i'm i'm not defending that kind of institution or those kind of solutions to the problem of regulating heterosexuality um what i'm highlighting is the enormous difference between what's considered normal now and what has been considered normal in pretty much every culture before the late 1960s um and it is not obvious to me by any means that that our culture successfully manages the inherent problems that we face as a species um better than every other i think what we i think what we the pattern that we have seen in the last 60 years has been women encouraged um, by men, by each other, by the culture at large, um, to imitate masculine sexuality, the worst kind of masculine sexuality, the kind of voracious, casual, loveless style of masculine sexuality um, as a supposed route to liberation and to reject everything of the past as, as inherently oppressive to women. And I think that that, that, that is a, has been a disaster. <laughs> Um, do you think do you think monogamy is natural? Do you, and I, I guess by that I mean this this norm that you're you're referencing, um, where both men and women constrain and, in your words, oppress. I would I would maybe use the word suppress instead of or, or what's the the Freudian word repress? Repress, yeah. <laughs> repress. Some kind uh, of pressing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, with both men and women repress their sexuality to some extent women perhaps more before marriage and, and men in marriage. Um, is that natural or is that a construct, a societal construct? Because unlike some of the other biological differences between men and women, it doesn't seem clear to me what the answer is. Because there's certainly been societies that are essentially harem based, right? There's been a lot of them. Um, so about 80% of societies on the anthropological record have been poly poly polygynous. So men taking multiple wives. And about twenty percent have been monogamous. There haven't, there are no, there are almost no polyandrous societies, and those they tend to have a strange sets of environmental pressures on them. Um, and polyandry normally looks actually like women marrying two brothers. You know, this isn't some sort of um, sexual paradise for women by any means. Um, it does seem as if poly polygamy is is our um, our default setting. Um, normally not very, very extreme polygamy, not the vast harems of, um, of history, but normally high status men having say two or three wives and low status men having none. Um, and women not necessarily having a great deal of say about who they marry. And I think that one of the pieces of evidence that suggests that polygamy is probably our default setting is the fact that we seem to drift back towards it on dating apps where there is no monogamous institution sort of forbidding high status men from having multiple partners simultaneously or consecutively. Um, what, what the monogamous restriction does, and it does have to be imposed, you know, people will not left to the, Left to their own devices, people will not generally settle at that kind of wide scale monogamous system, even though it is generally what women want and it is better for societies in general. It reduces crime and domestic violence and sexual violence and all sorts of um, there are all sorts of un unwanted outcomes associated with polygamy. Um, the, but the reason that the monogamous marriage system when it's imposed works is because it does seem to to, to produce healthier societies um even if it's not actually what the high status men want um i have i have heard it described as sexual socialism <laughs> just like uh, like tongue-in-cheek but also does describe something um something true and interesting which is that high status men would prefer to have multiple wives but when they are prevented from doing so it is actually better for both low status men and for women and for children um so monogamy is not natural but it is better 
I think that those, I think those two things, I think that's completely, you know, I'm, I'm rejecting the naturalistic fallacy. Those two things are completely compatible. Um, if I were taking your, uh, sir, your heuristic for thinking about rather than about ideas or activists, um, historical and economic circumstance, I would, I would say maybe that polygamy is or that kind of polygamy, polygamous society that lends high status men to multiple wives, low status men with no wives, women primarily attracted to high status men, but then having to share them. Um, I would say that that works probably much better in, in a more stable way in pre um, agrarian societies, right? In, 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 in uh, societies in which there is an outlet for all the excess men, which is war. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, if you look at like some of the indigenous societies in, in the United States, or, I mean, um, the, the raiding and the, um, you know, you steal the women from the other tribe, you, you increase your tribe that way, but also both tribes need the warfare to siphon off essentially excess men in the society <laughs> to send them to die. Um, because the problem with polygamy, when you stay put, unless you are a very small um, insular polygamous society inside of a larger monogamous culture. So here I'm thinking like fundamentalist Mormons mm -hmm. um, compounds, right? They do the same thing. They just expel young men. Yeah. Right? I was going to ask, what do they, yeah, what do they do with their excess men? They join mainstream society. Yeah. They just kick them out of the compound. Mm. Um, sometimes on, on explicit grounds, but um, usually on, on the basis of, of essentially fraternizing with the potential wives of the elders. Right. Mm. Um, so you need you need some. I imagine that actually is somewhat more of a, a stable, um, try in, in like a, a more tribal environment that might actually be a stable system. But as soon as you know you have longevity of men and you're staying put in one place and you don't really have any place to to send all of these excess men, they they get mad. Um, mm. So yeah. I, I would they imagine the village that, down. that might be perhaps how we started with some of this is. Um, allows us to stay in one place and, and to build um, and to encourage men to to build something of themselves in order to attain a wife. Um, that I can imagine those things having external positive um, influence on the society, even if they're restricting the individual. Mm. Our own monogamous system um, originates with the Romans. Um, who had radically different sexual sexual ethics from 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 us? I mean, our well, I mean, this brings us on to a whole other conversation. But our 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 sexual ethics are still largely derived from Christianity, even if in a complex and um, kind of patricidal way, um, which was of course not true in 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 pre Christian Roman society. But they did have a monogamous marriage system, which probably was one reason why they were as successful as they were as an empire because because monogamous marriage system is good is is good for societies it makes them more stable um more able to spread um and um yes the the the, the issue of the issue of all the excess men is a really difficult one um, do you, you send them off to war, you send them to the salt mines, you, you make them into eunuchs and slaves, you know, there are all sorts of horrible possible solutions. Um, you turn them into incel gamers who live in their mother's basements. Like every every polygonous society has to come up with something. Um, that's the solution that we're sort of drifting towards. But, um, yeah, B because we have rejected, I mean, the the... I had an interesting comment recently from um, Tom Holland, British historian, who um, wrote this tremendous book, Dominion, on the on the the influence of Christianity on the West, and he suggested that it took a long time for people in the 16th century to realise that they were living through what we now call the Reformation, and he's and he he suspects that in the future we will recognize that the period that we are now living through is a sort of second reformation, except that instead of rejecting Catholicism, what we're rejecting is Christianity per se, 
and this was a this was a project begun in the 1960s and we're still feeling its reverberations and you know there are there were reasons there were reasons for people to do that you know it was partly i suppose about the the destabilizing and um and horrible effects of the second world war um encouraging a, a sort of an, an undermining of of faith in the in in the culture that had come before that had produced something as dreadful as the second world war um and it was to do with affluence um, and economic growth and all of the radically destabilizing effects of technology, including, of course, the pill, um, whatever the cause. I think that the 1960s, including the, the, including the sexual revolution as one component of that, should be understood as, as basically a rejection of Christianity. And we're seeing that play out now, including, for instance, a drift back towards a pre, pre-Christian model of sexual ethics. Um, but there's a tension there, which I think is interesting. So on the one hand, we've got the rejection of marriage. We've got a drift towards polygyny. I am sure that the next frontier is going to be a push towards polyamorous marriage. There are already some polyamorous who are pushing for polyamorous marriage to be recognized in law. Um, and even though polyamory doesn't always look like polygyny I think it's very likely that it would drift towards polygyny given that that is a human norm I mean admittedly we have we have different conditions from our ancestors we have the pill we have antibiotics we have all of these things which which um do radically transform sexuality but given everything that's come before I think it's extremely likely that, that what polyamorous marriage would end up looking like was much more like polygynous marriage of the past and, of, and indeed of, of other cultures overseas. Um, and, and, and yes, we have, so I think that what we have is simultaneously this tension between a feminist movement that wants to reject Christian sexual ethics, but a feminist movement that is also largely derived from Christianity because everything, every, the air we breathe is derived from Christianity. All of our moral principles are derived from Christianity, so much so that we don't even know it. Ideas like um, humility and the protection of the weak and um, the whole idea of progress as a sort of um, historical project looking to the future these are all derived ultimately from christianity except that they are no longer explicitly acknowledged as being derived from christianity including feminism um but it's but it's a i think i think probably i think probably the best metaphor for understanding it is a sort of feminist movement that is soaring off the branch on which on which it sits and is potentially unwittingly as we've seen with the trans movement, paving the way for new post-Christian phenomena, which are actually radically anti-women. Yeah, this is this is kind of the argument that you made in Compact Magazine. Um, mm -hmm. And you use a jumping off point, you use Andrew Tate, who I had never heard of until like a month ago. <laughs> Me um, neither, until I was commissioned to write about him. I think he's... <laughs> It's a kind of I've heard this theory which is quite interesting that he's a he's a slightly weird artifact of the TikTok algorithm in that he doesn't actually have that many real fans. It's just that he for some reason engaged the the virality thing um and ended up on everyone's timelines. Um, but, yeah anyway, but, and you take <laughs> right but you regardless of how he became uh sort of TikTok famous, at least, um, you essentially argue, I would say partially what you just argued, which is that feminism is reliant on certain Christian norms that are so um, ingrained in our society that we don't even see that they're related. Um, one of which, by the way, that you didn't mention, um, but we've talked about at the beginning of this podcast was is the, the norm against uh, sexually using children, um, which the Romans certainly had no norm in the ancient world had had no moral qualms with doing um yeah. 
So I guess that goes under protection of the weak. But, um, you know, so the other party argument, though, is, is kind of a, you know, be careful what you wish for uh, kind of warning that says to feminists, you may not like the sexual world that you are constructing. Um, already, we're, I think we're seeing a bit of a... I mean, even the New York Times has written about sort of a sex negativity of Gen Z. I mean, how, mm -hmm. how has your book been received? I mean, have you, um, you know, have you spoken to uh, a, a lot of like young women or young men? Because um, you must have gotten feedback on this from various readers. And I'm wondering if you got the response you thought you would to this book or if you're getting something that surprises you in the response. Because it does seem like there is... Um, on both left and right, and for different reasons, there seems to be a kind of consensus forming that the current state between the sexes is not good, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to that late 1970s kind of promise of the sexual revolution, everyone is going to be more fulfilled, more you know happy, we're going to live more authentically in our sexual desires or whatever. Um, and it seems like we have approached a point where even if we don't agree on where we go from here, we seem to agree that this isn't great. So I'm wondering how that's factored into the response to your book. I yeah, I would agree that that does seem to be the emerging consensus. Um, so the response to my book has been a lot more positive than I thought it would be. I thought I would I thought I'd get a lot more cancelled than I have, um, and I haven't. I mean, I've had um, very nice coverage in places like the New York Times and the Observer um I've been ignored otherwise I would say I haven't really been the victim of any kind of cancellation campaign um what's happened more often is that I've had a combination of positive coverage and and just no coverage at all from the left and positive coverage exclusively from the right with some criticism obviously I mean you know, that's fine a criticism from every possible angle as well um which just suggests that I'm being original, even if I'm not correct. And yeah, the, the, and the response I've had from readers in general, I'd say that the most common response from readers um, is something along the lines of, thank you for saying this, I've been thinking this to my, quietly um, this whole time. And that's a response that is across age groups. Although I think that the most, I think I would say that in general, the the group who are most likely to entirely agree with my thesis are middle-aged women, particularly the mothers of teenage children, and I don't think that's to I don't think that's a generational thing because generally we're talking about boomers, you know, women who've been brought up very much within the kind of um, progressive ideological norms. Um, I think it's a life cycle thing. I think it's because these are the women who have have seen the downsides of the sexual revolution for themselves and are concerned for their children. Um, and these are women who are coming who are who are coming from a pretty much across the political spectrum as well. Um, because as you say, I think that there is a I think it is so obvious that there are serious dysfunctions in our sexual culture and that the promise of the sexual revolution has has not been realized from from the left's perspective um the question is just how how we diagnose the problem and what therefore is the prognosis um my, and my my prescription is definitely not from war and war freedom um well aside from not going further down the freedom rabbit hole um i'd like to close by asking you you know, where do we go from here? Which I realize is a, a huge question. And I don't expect you to have like a 10 point plan or anything, but um, it does seem, and, and this is where I, I sometimes depart from, I'm, I'm pretty extremely conservative on, especially on social matters, but it also seems to me that it's impossible to return in, in a certain way. Um, so where do you think we go from here in terms of, let's say the best case scenario, we have a broader part of the public that recognizes that the sort of sexual free for all that we've built ourselves um, comes with serious costs and consequences. You know, what, well, how should we go about 
either rebuilding old norms or, or building new ones? I mean, where do you see this going in your most optimistic days? I mean, one uh, ray of light is that um, individuals do still have quite a lot of power to decide how they behave. You know, it is that I think that there is this sort of um, sexual counter-revolution happening, uh, which has been written about in a, a lot of outlets, including on the left. And um, it's generally an elite phenomenon, as indeed sex positive feminism was. You know, we're, we're kind of talking about intra-elite ideological battles here, um, but obviously ones that have serious effects for everyone in society. Um, you know, it is still... It is still you. You can still get married. You can still decide not to, not to have sex before marriage. You can still decide to live a quite a traditional life. It's not the it's not the path of least resistance, and it's strangely countercultural, <laughs> given um, given where we're at now in the culture. But it is still available to people. Um, so on an individual level, um, I think readers can feel like actually they have a great deal of power in their own hands that it is more challenging to find a partner who wants to do that too i would say that and i and i and i i uh, quite a common um email that i'll receive from young female readers is something along the lines of i don't know how to find i don't know how, how to find a partner in this kind of pornified dating market um where you're expected to have sex on a first date and so on and i agree that that is really serious i, I agree that that's a really serious challenge if, however, you are able to do that, um, then you can, you know, you have you have autonomy. Um, when it comes to the culture in general and the incentive structure in general, I think that is much more difficult because the pill's not going away, even if we wanted it to. It's, it can't be uninvented. Um, I mean, it may be that um, my friend Mary Harrington, who's got a book coming out next year, she's a writer on her she expects there will be more of a swing back against the pill, partly because of the environmental impact that it has um, on the ecosystem, which is quite severe. So it may be that actually the idea of rejecting the pill becomes moves within the Overton window in a way that it isn't at the moment. I don't know. Um, but in general, the, the radical material changes that we've seen are, are very unlikely to be reversed which does mean, for instance, that any kind of conservative fantasy of all women leaving the workforce en masse and everyone kind of going back to entirely gender segregated lives is very unlikely to ever happen. Um, I hope, though, I mean, I, I, I didn't write about policy in this book. I do care a lot about policy. And I have actually this summer founded, co-founded um, a non-partisan feminist think tank um, here in London, which is entirely geared around <laughs> policy ideas relating to um, men and women and families and how to sort of um, reconstruct the things that liberalism has destroyed. I didn't go into them in this book, though, because it's just, it was just completely beyond the scope. Um, I think, though, that there are, there are, there are, old, there are old institutions which I think we have only discovered their merits by attempts to destroy them. Um, marriage is one of them. And I have a chapter where I make a feminist case for marriage and say that it actually protects the interests of women and children um, far better than pretty much any, not just pretty much, than any institution that we that we know of, that we've, that we've tried as a species. Um, also things like, I think, sex segregation schools is a really good thing. And I think the experiment with co-education um, has not produced very pretty results. Um, I think that the protection of mothers and children's interests has to mean not forcing women back into the workforce, as has been considered the standard um, feminist policy prescription for the last half century. Um, because there are profound differences between mothers and fathers and it's not what women want and it's not what is in children's best interest in most cases. So so they, they, there needs to be a kind of negotiation with the material conditions we have now, basically. But I, um, 
a pragmatic one, I hope. Well, Louise Perry, thank you so much for coming on, on High Noon. Um, it was a pleasure to have you. And um, go, go, go read, go buy um, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Uh, I think it's, it really stood out to me as, because there's, there's a lot of these books um, that are in some way arguing against where we are at, but yours really stood out to me because, again, as I kind of opened this podcast with, you're, you're really grappling with the underlying I feel like a lot of these books basically start and say, you know, it was fine in the seventies and eighties and nineties. And now we've just kind of gone off the rails, right. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe too much of a good thing, maybe whatever. Um, and I, I really think the the reality is perhaps harder to confront than that, that, that the sexual freedoms are in an in inherent way tied to um, the downsides, which as you just said, in a pragmatic way, doesn't mean necessarily the, even the possibility of completely rolling them back, but it means we have to find a practical way to negotiate through those consequences and try to, to mitigate some of them um, in a real way, because it certainly seems that we're more miserable than we used to be in this, in this realm. And uh, to the extent that one thinks that's a bad thing, uh, which I think most people do, <laughs> um, we'd like to see it change. So, so thank you so much um, for coming on High Noon. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Um, also, check out our other uh, podcasts. Um, we have a podcast called At the Bar, where, which I do with my colleague Jennifer Braceres on legal and cultural issues. Um, and also, we have a podcast called She Thinks with Beverly Hallberg, which does a more day-to-day -day news and policy uh, little download. I highly encourage you to check those out. Uh, for all of those things, please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, and IWF.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon. <laughs>